Okay, welcome everybody. My name is Emmerich Davies and I'm an assistant professor at the Harvard Graduate School of Education um, and a co-convener of the Brown Harvard MIT joint seminar um, on South Asian politics with um, Ashutosh Varshney, uh, who is a professor of political science at Brown University. Um, we're really excited to have um, Adi Dasgupta with us uh, here today uh, to present some of his uh, continuing work on the impact of technological change in India, um, giving a title, what, a, call, a talk called Weapons of the Week, The Violent Consequences of Biased Technological Change. Um, Adi is an assistant professor um, at UC Merced, um, and he's published in a number of political science journals, American Journal of Political Science, American Political Science Review, International Organization, um, and um, super excited to hear um, about his uh, continuing work um, on agricultural technological change in India. Um, Adi is gonna speak um, and present for about 40 to, uh, to 50 minutes. Um, and then we also have um, a discussant uh, here with us today, uh, Pavi Suranarayan from Johns Hopkins University an assistant professor um, in the political science department there. Um, Without further ado, join me in welcoming uh, welcoming Adi um, and Adi. Over to over to you. Okay. Um, so thanks for the invitation to give this talk here today, Emmerich and Ashu. Um, and thanks so much, Pavi, in advance for your um, feedback on this. Um, and thanks to everyone else who, who came. Um, I hope you find this interesting. Um, so this is a uh, project uh, which is a relatively new paper, but it's also part of my book project. Um, looking at the long run political consequences of the Green Revolution in India um, and the many uh, transformative effects it had on Indian politics. This project is called, uh, or the paper is called Weapons of the Week, the Violent Consequences of Biased Technological Change. So in this project, I depart from the observation um, that there's now a consensus that technological change is one of the fundamental drivers of long-term economic growth and prosperity. But at the same time, there's a growing awareness that technological change is not a rising tide that lifts all boats, at least not all boats equally, uh, but typically a biased process that benefits some groups more than others. So it has distributional consequences. Um, as a result, um, the gains from technological change are typically distributed unequally across groups in society. Um, and as a result, technological revolutions often correspond to periods of growing socioeconomic inequality. Um, and so in this project, I ask what are the consequences of technology-driven inequality, um, specifically for political action by the relative losers of technological So of course, perhaps the most famous uh, contribution to this debate um, comes from Karl Marx himself, who um, in the communist manifesto in the midst of the industrial revolution, argued that uh, biased technological change um, would eventually lead to a backlash um, from workers um, against uh, rising inequality um, and as a product of uh, the class conflict that was created by technological change. Um, Marx's insight in many ways is kind of echoed by contemporary models in political economy. Um, for example, the model of Meltzer and Richard predicts that uh, the, the level of redistribution um, in society should increase uh, with inequality. Uh, similarly, the compensation hypothesis in the literature on sort of the domestic politics around globalization suggests that governments should compensate uh, the relative losers of uh, globalization in order to maintain continuing political support. So we might expect to see something similar in the case of technology driven um, inequality. Um, yet in practice, it's not clear that the historical record supports these predictions. Um, and we see surprisingly little redistribution of the surplus that is generated um, by biased technological change. Um, for example, if you're in the United States, look at what's been going on around us since the 1980s. Um, Automation, the spread of computers, and skill-biased technological change has produced growing inequality in uh, the earnings of high-skill and low-skill workers. 
Uh, yet there's been little observable increase in redistribution or leftward shift in the locus of politics. Or we could look back further in history to the Industrial Revolution, um, which also produced a lot of inequality up until the late 1800s, uh, but which produced little redistribution, let alone a communist revolution, as Marx had predicted. Um, so on the basis of this kind of discrepancy between empirics and theory, um, I, in this project, I developed a modified hypothesis. Um, which is that often the relative losers of technological change may simply lack the political power needed to pursue redistribution through the political system. Um, and in these contexts, they may turn instead to informal tactics of protest and redistribution, um, including crime and violence. Um, I call these tactics weapons of the week, um, drawing explicitly on the terminology of Dean Scott, um, because I argue that these tactics are not kind of the incipient stages of large scale of collective action at the ballot box, but rather a substitute adopted by groups that aren't powerful enough to pursue their aims through the formal political system. Um, and if the argument is correct, this would help us understand um, why we see so little redistribution during periods of biased technological change, um, as well as why periods of technological change are often accompanied by so much violence. So there are many famous episodes of violent reactions to technological change throughout history. Perhaps the most famous case is uh, that of the Luddites, uh, the skilled uh, textile weavers in industrializing England who resorted to breaking the stocking frames that were rendering obsolete their skills. Uh, to the swing riots, uh, the movement of British agricultural workers who started destroying the threshing machines uh, which were depressing agricultural wages, also the Asian person. Um, we can think of more modern examples. James Scott himself worked on kind of peasant uh, reactions to mechanization in rural Malaysia. Um, he documents a number of tactics they adopted, one of which was kind of sabotage of the combine harvesters. And an interesting phenomenon that's only beginning to emerge, this is a recent article from the New York Times um, on this kind of emergent phenomena where, phenomenon where um, people apparently have this tendency to attack uh, robots and various forms of like automated and self-driving cars. Um, so this is by no means something uh, that's uh, a relic of the past in these violent reactions to technological change. So to test the argument, I turned to the context of uh, India's Green Revolution, uh, which was a period of agricultural transformation due to the introduction of a new crop technology, um, high yielding variety crops. Um, as I'll provide evidence, uh, the spread of HYV crops in India between the 1960s and the 1980s uh, greatly improved agricultural productivity, um, but for reasons I'll discuss also increased inequality between landowners and the rural So what I'll show is that uh, the spread of HYV crops contributed to an upsurge of rural crime, um, specifically in the form of dequity, um, which is like the South Asian term for rural banditry, uh, a crime that's significant because it contains elements of social protest against inequality, um, and also represents, of course, a, a form of small scale bilateral redistribution. So for empirical evidence, I'll connect district level panel data on the share of agricultural land planted with HYV crops linked to newly digitized district level crime records um, and show provide evidence for this. Um, I'll also show that the spread of HYV crops did not uh, impact any other form of crime, suggesting that this wasn't just opportunistic plundering, uh, but a selective form of violence uh, that in response specifically to rising inequality. And I'll also show that the spread of HYV crops uh, did not improve the performance of left-wing parties, uh, despite the initial fears of some that the Green Revolution might have turned into a Red Revolution or a Communist Revolution. Consistent this with being a kind of weapons of the weak tactic rather than the early stages of collective action for redistribution at the ballot box. Uh, 
Um, so many of you here, uh, of course, will be familiar with the Green Revolution, but I'll just provide a little bit of background. Um, High-yielding variety crops were a new uh, crop technology uh, developed by the American agronomist Norman Borlaug, who was working for the Rockefeller Foundation in northern Mexico in the 1950s. Uh, the newly developed HYV crops uh, under the right conditions were up to twice as productive as traditional varieties. Um, and this was quickly seen as a kind of solution to the hunger crisis, which was enveloping much of the developing world at the time. So the US government, along with the Rockefeller and Ford Foundations and other agencies, uh, helped propagate this new crop technology um, around the developing world, uh, which spread like wildfire and helped to end global hunger. Barlog won a Nobel Prize for his work. So, as HYV crops spread, um, you know, social scientists uh, studied its consequences on the ground and they found that uh, HYV crops produced new wealth and agricultural output improved productivity, uh, but they also tended to increase rural inequality um, for the following reasons. Uh, the cultivation of HYV crops was extremely capital intensive, uh, requiring farmers to make large fixed cost investments in inputs like uh, seeds, fertilizer, pesticides, and most of all, irrigation. Um, the new crops were extremely water intensive. Uh, this resulted in economies of scale, which meant that, at, especially in the early stages, HYV crops were overwhelmingly adopted by farmers with larger land. Uh, so the net effect was that, especially in the early stages, the Green Revolution you know, transformed agricultural productivity, uh, but also widened inequality, much like any new technology. Um, this is just to give you a sense of what the new crop technology looked like. Uh, the improved HYV varieties were typically shorter in stature, um, which enabled them to support sort of denser and heavier grains without the plants falling over or logging. Um, so this is some data on uh, the share of agricultural land planted with HYV crops across different regions of the world over time. Uh, this is some data from Evanson and Roland. Um, so this is just to show you uh, what a gigantic transformation in agriculture the Green Revolution represented. Apologies for the small text. This is uh, no land planted with HYV crops. This is 100% more all land planted crops over time. And as you can see, one of the regions of the world where the Green Revolution occurred with the greatest intensity was South Asia, um, and specifically India, the setting of this study. So HYV crops and the Green Revolution arrived in India um, on a large scale basis starting in 1966, uh, 1967. Um, in the Q&A, if it's interesting, we can uh, talk about the reasons for this. Um, uh, but as HYV, uh, initially HYV crops were spread through a program known as the Intensive Agricultural Districts Program and then was scaled up nationally. Um, as HYV crops spread, they produced the same consequences in India, anthropologists uh, found, uh, that they did elsewhere, right? HYV cr crops produced this new upwardly mobile class of prospering landowning farmers who the Rudolphs famously called bullet cart capitalists, right? But at the same time, there were many elements of uh, the rural poor, um, smallholders, tenants, laborers who did not benefit arguably from the Green Revolution to the same extent. Um, so one political scientist, Francine Frankel, um, did some field work in India uh, during the early stages of the Green Revolution and she came to a grim conclusion in her book entitled India's Green Revolution, Economic Gains and Political Costs. Uh, she argued that uh, skyrocketing rural inequality uh, due to the Green Revolution was creating simmering resentment among the rural poor, which if not addressed could explode in the form of a red revolution or a sort of communist revolution in the countryside. Um, this was not just the fear of observers, uh, but that of the Indian government as well. Um, in 1969, the Home Ministry released a report on the causes and nature of current agrarian tensions, which warned that the widening gap between the relatively few affluent farmers and the large body of smallholders will end in an explosion. So retrospectively, of course, we know that a communist revolution never materialized in the countryside, um, but why not? 
Um, and what I argue is that this is possibly because the reaction to hydrogen equality in this period took other forms. So this is just some data on the uh, district level seat share and state assembly elections of communist and socialist parties um, in the district in the sample in the study, which is uh, the major states in India. And it shows you that if anything, far from a left, you know, left wing revolution over the period of the personal green revolution, uh, left wing parties actually tended to lose um, the seat share of it. So fears of a communist revolution, you know, um, might seem far-fetched, you know, especially in, in the current climate, uh, but they were very real given the context of the time, right? Given the spread of communism in rural uh, parts of nearby countries like China and Southeast Asia. In India itself, uh, the Naxalbari uh, uh, or Naxalite movement had, um, just occurred, you know, this episode of uh, far left violence in West Bengal. Um, and the political context of, uh, of the time also mattered. Um, at the time, the greatest electoral threat to the dominant Congress party came from parties on the left, from communist and socialist parties, which were beginning to make major inroads in um, several states. Um, but of course, uh, <clears throat> The Red Revolution never materialized, um, so why not? Why didn't we see electoral support for redistribution in a context of rising inequality? So James Scott in his book, Weapons of the Weak, famously argues that subordinate groups often are forced to resort uh, to what he called weapons of the weak or everyday slash informal tactics of class struggle uh, because they sometimes lack the political power needed to achieve their aims through open conflict, for example, through the political system. And I would argue that this is very relevant to the context of rural India, um, where we have a lot of research that shows that local party organization, especially in the Congress party, um, was dominated by rural elites, um, and where land very much equated to power in village social life. While we might hypothetically imagine that the rural poor might have been receptive to promises from politicians and parties of redistribution, uh, land reform, um, and other kind of pro-poor agendas, as a practical matter outside of two states, West Bengal and Kerala, um, communist and socialist parties had very little organizational presence in rural areas that would have plausibly been needed to mobilize the rural poor as an interest group behind redistributive platforms. And for these reasons, I argue, um, you know, it would have been prohibitively difficult for kind of this redistributive agenda uh, supported by the rural poor to materialize, materialize at the ballot box. And as a result, uh, the reaction to inequality took other forms, in particular, an explosion of rural banditry or dequity that took place during the 1970s and 1980s. Um, so this is some data. Um, from annual uh, crime in India reports that are produced by the National Crime Records Bureau on the nationwide total of dequities committed um, every year. And what you can see is that right around the time of the introduction of HYD crops in 1967, there's this huge spike, which peaks around 1980 and then subsequently recedes in the occurrence of dequity. Um, at the height of this spike in 1980, you see uh, more than threefold increase or 300% increase in the number of dequities that are occurring relative to 1960. So I don't know that scholarship has necessarily kind of documented, you know, the roots of this explosion of dequity, um, but it was certainly a phenomenon that was reflected in kind of media and popular culture. Um, Bollywood produced a number of films uh, which depicted the quites either as villains or as heroes. Um, you know, of course, the most famous example is going to be Shole and Gabur Singh. Um, in real life, there were um, you know the quites who acquired celebrities as kind of rebels fighting against oppressive rural power structures. So famous the quites like Kulan Devi or Pan Singh Tomar. Um, and the spike in the um, is significant. 
because dacoity very much resembles what Hobsbawm famously called a form of social banditry. Um, or in Hobsbawm's words, a form of kind of rebellion in peasant societies. So in a rural sort of folk tradition in India, um, dacoity is a form of crime incorporates elements of social protest against rural inequality and oppressive power structures. So at least in mythology, there were many, you know, Dequites who were outlaws who abided by a code of ethics, you know, typically targeting oppressive rural elites, uh, traders, colonial authorities, but not the rural poor. Um, in fact, many Dequites uh, styled themselves as baghis or rebels rather than criminals. Um, apart from sort of uh, the kind of traditional association with social protest, uh, Dequity also plausibly served as a form of small scale redistribution. Um, a lot of historical research and quantitative uh, data that I'll show uh, will provide evidence that Dequity was a scarcity crime that tended to rise during periods of scarcity like famine and droughts. Um, so people moved into Dequites or temporarily participated in Dequity. Um, when economic circumstances force them into it. Um, and so what I'm arguing is that rising inequality in districts impacted by the Green Revolution plausibly led to support for or participation in dequity as a form of both social protest and redistribution on a small scale. So let's turn to uh, the actual um, empirical analysis. Uh, the first thing I want to show you is that HYV crops um, did in plausibly increase rural inequality. Um, and to look at this, I'm gonna draw on a survey called the ARIS survey conducted by the National Council for Applied Economic Research, uh, which was a multi-wave national probability sample of rural households conducted between 1968 and 1971, specifically designed to study the distribution of consequences of the Green Revolution. So this was a survey of over 4,000 households, uh, which collected data on their income and consumption um, and their land holdings and critically whether or not they were adopting the new crop technology or not. Um, so this provides an opportunity to study first who was able to adopt the new crop technology and especially how this functioned, how this varied as a function of their land endowments. Uh, it also provides an opportunity to study changes over time in the incomes of HYV crop adopters versus non-adopters in a kind of panel fixed effects framework to see whether or not differences in HYV crop adoption over time increased in privilege and equality. Yeah. So this is just some descriptive uh, data showing average rates of HYV crop adoption across cultivating households divided into quartiles of land ownership. And this is incorporating survey weights. So this is a proportionally representative um, data. So the first thing to see here, right, is that adoption of HYV crops rises steeply with land holdings. This is as of 1971. So the top quartile of landowners uh, were adopting HYV crops at more than double, more than double the rate uh, of um, cultivating households in the bottom quartile of the land ownership. Yeah. Consistent with these economies of scale that made it more profitable for larger landowners to cultivate the new crop technology. Um, now, these are some regression results which study the effects of HYV crop adoption in adopting households versus non-adopting households. Um, what these coefficients are telling us, and I'm controlling here for household fixed effects and village year fixed effects. So we're comparing households over time, the evolution of their incomes of households adopting the new technology versus those not adopting the new crop technology. Um, and we see that crop technology adoption led to large improvements in per capita household income, um, whether we are looking at the sample of uh, all rural households, just those households um, working in agriculture, or restricting the sample of cultivating households. We see that HYV crop adoption led to about a 7% in relative increase in incomes. Um, so what we see here is that HYV crops were uh, adopted predominantly by larger landowners, and this plausibly contributed to, to rising intra-village inequality. Okay, so next we look at the impact of HYV crops on crime. Okay. 
So to look at this, I digitized data on different cognizable offenses uh, that are reported by the National Crime Records Bureau in annual reports uh, for all districts between 1971 and 1987. Um, so for every available category of crime. I then link this to district level panel data on the share of agricultural land planted with HIV crops. This comes from annual sort of agricultural surveys, which are collected and compiled by the Indian government. And connecting these data sets, I'm going to take a panel fixed effects OLS and Poisson regression approach, looking at how within district changes in the share of agricultural land planted with HIV crops affected different forms of crime. Um, so this is where the data comes from, these kind of psychedelic uh, crime in India reports, you know. <laughs> I don't I have no idea why they have these uh, extremely colorful covers, but they do, it's kind of interesting. Um, here is what the data inside looks like. It comprises these tables on 11 different forms of crime. Uh, and I can geocoded these data to uh, districts, aggregating all data to the level of 1961 districts. Uh, to account for district splits over time. So this is a map of uh, average annual uh, dequities in the data set by district, um, focusing on the districts where we have HYB crop adoption data available. Um, the sample average was, I think, about 44 dequities per district year. This is what uh, average uh, HYV crop adoption or the average share of agricultural land planted with HYV crops looked like. Um, again, just averaging uh, across all years. These are kind of cross-sectional snapshots. Of course, we'll be looking in the empirical analysis at changes over time. So let me now just turn to reporting the empirical results. Uh, what I want to first show you is that dequity as a form of crime indeed was a kind of scarcity crime that responded to economic conditions uh, in the form of rainfall shocks. Yeah. So here I'm looking at the impact of rainfall shocks uh, on the occurrence of dequity, um, where rainfall shocks are defined in terms of uh, standardized, de standardized deviations in rainfall from a district's long run mean. Uh, these are OLS uh, fixed effects regressions. What these coefficients here are telling you is that when a district experienced a worse than normal uh, monsoon rainfall, uh, you saw an increase in the occurrence of dequity. And what the, the coefficients on these lag variables is telling us is that this effect was actually persistent over time, suggesting that there might have been a kind of recruitment effect as people moved into uh, dequite gangs following um, negative rainfall shocks. And that this plausibly does support the idea that the DECOID represented a form of small scale redistribution in times of um, economic hardship. When we look at other forms of violent crime, which is the sum of all occurrences of murder, culpable homicide, kidnap and rape, uh, we see no such pattern of coefficients, uh, consistent with the idea that you know, those were not kind of um, redistributive or Um, so this is the main set of results. Um, I'm reporting both OLS and Poisson regression coefficients. Um, so let's just look at the baseline specification over here in, in column one. Uh, what this is saying is that in a district over time, as you go from no agricultural land planted with HYV crops to all of a district's agricultural land planted with HYV crops, uh, this is estimated to increase the average annual occurrence of dequity by about 18 additional incidents per district year. Um, that's a pretty large effect relative to the sample average of 44 dequities per district year. Um, it corresponds to about a 0.6 within district standard deviation um, in dequity. Uh, this holds whether we're controlling just for year fixed effects or region year fixed effects. Um, but we restrict the comparisons over time to districts located within the same region, north, south, east, and west. Um, technically, you know, Poisson regressions might be better suited to the analysis of count data, but we can't analysis, uh, interpret the coefficients directly. 
Um, so to interpret them, uh, we exponentiate the coefficient and subtract one to get the estimated percentage change um, in dequity uh, resulting from uh, going from no agricultural land planted with HYV crops to all the district agricultural land planted with HYV crops. Um, and what this coefficient suggests is that this change in HYV crop adoption is estimated to produce a 150% improvement, not improvement, increase in the rate of occurrence of dequities. An extremely large effect, right, which could plausibly account for a lot of the spike in dequity that was occurring during the Green Revolution. So in this table, I take the same uh, empirical strategy. Uh, these are just the OLS coefficients. Uh, looking at every other form of crime that's reported in the NCRB uh, reports. Um, and what you can see here is that pretty much we see this, we see no such relationship with any other form of crime. If anything, the coefficients tend to be negative, suggesting that crimes tended to, other forms of crime tended to fall with spread of HIV crops which would be more consistent with the kind of ordinarily positive relationship between development and conflict. Um, the only coefficient which is kind of sizable and positive, though not statistically significant, is that on robbery. And robbery as a form of crime is actually, uh, the legal definition of this is quite similar to that of dequity in the Indian Penal Code. Dequity legally is uh, armed robbery by a group of five or more people, and robbery is just uh, same act committed in less than So what this is telling us is that, um, you know, it's partially a placebo test, right? Um, but it's also partially suggesting that, you know, this upsurge of dequity was not just opportunistic plundering or senseless violence, um, but a selective form of violence in response to rural inequality, representing protest as well as small scale redistribution. Um, here uh, are just some uh, where I'm now looking at the impact of the spread of HYV crops on district level seat share of left-wing um, parties. So a set of communist and socialist parties. Um, in other work, I've analyzed this data in a number of ways. So let me just say that there's no evidence that the spread of HYV crops uh, benefited left-wing parties as Francine Frankel might have you know, predicted. Um, here we see that the coefficients are close to zero, pretty precisely estimated and actually slightly negative. So what this is telling us is that the spread of HYV crops and the epidemic of dequity that followed was probably not a pre precursor to kind of large scale collective action by the rural poor at the ballot box, but rather a substitute um, for weapons of abuse. Um, so um, let me just uh, conclude here. Um, what I've argued in this project is that technological change is typically biased. Um, so new technologies augment the productivity of some factors of production, in this case land, more than others. Uh, and they produce wealth that is distributed uh, unequally across uh, groups in society. Um, though our kind of canonical models in political economy that with, predict that with rising inequality, we see, sort of automatically see a greater support for redistribution in the political system, what I've argued is that in many cases, the relative losers of technological change lack the political power needed to pursue redistribution and compensation through the formal political system. And in these contexts, they may turn to crime and violence as everyday tactics of protest and redistribution instead. Um, in the context of rural India, um, I've argued that available kind of repertoires of contention uh, meant that these weapons of the weak tactics took in part the form of this epidemic of dequity that took place during the 1970s and 1980s. But we could well imagine that these tactics would look different in other contexts, and that would be an interesting topic for research. Um, more broadly, um, I think the argument and findings here can help us understand why in history, you know, we have this recurrent pattern where technological revolutions produce a lot of inequality, but surprisingly little redistribution, um, but instead a lot of violence. Um, and since uh, we have a lot of experts on kind of 
violence in South Asia, I thought I would also maybe end the discussion on a kind of methodological note, something that I've been thinking about that I'd love your thoughts and feedback on. Um, you know, one methodological challenge for me in this project um, has been the in trying to interpret what this kind of upsurge of dequities meant. Um, and that's kind of difficult because dequities, you know, by nature of this kind of covert crime, for the most part, did not leave written records about the motivations for their actions. So in the sense, we have to adopt kind of the approach of Guha, right? And analyze official crime statistics against the grain to kind of uh, to try to interpret what this epidemic of dequity represented. Um, so we might have a debate, right? Uh, was this upsurge of dequity just a form of sort of spasmodic or economic reaction to changing economic circumstances? Or did it also contain elements of political protest against inequality? Um, as you know, E.P. Thompson, he wrote this essay on the moral economy of the English crowd, uh, where he had this kind of similar debate about food rights in England. Um, were they just economic crime or did they represent um, some kind of a <clears throat> political reaction? Um, and I've argued for the latter. You know, um, especially looking at the fact that HYV crops increased in quite but not other forms of crime, that this was a specific form of violence which represented not just subsistence and redistribution, but a form of protest against rising rural inequality. Um, but I will say this has been a challenge for me in this project. I think it's an interesting methodological challenge for the social scientific interpretation of violence more generally. Uh, so with that, uh, let me end here. Um, and thank you so much for uh, any feedback and your questions. Look forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, Adi, for that wonderful presentation. Um, Pavi, over to, over to you. Oh, thank you, Emmerich. And um, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to discuss this really fascinating paper. Um, so this paper, is fundamentally about how rapid technological shifts shape inequality and redistributive claims. Adi argues that technological shifts have distributional consequences because new technologies will benefit those who hold the resources to adopt or use them and in the process create winners and losers. So technological shifts in this way are deeply consequential for inequality. He connects this aspect of what technology does to what it then means for how losers respond. Now, study, studies in political economy that examine the effects of inequality tend to typically focus on their effects on either voting or redistribution through the state. Instead, Adi argues that when losers don't have the ability to make collective claims, either because there is no political party that can accommodate their aspirations or because there are no organizations to channel their discontent, we see an emergence of a form of violence as a way to redistribute from the haves to the have-nots. Now he deploys an impressive array of data um, to make his claims. And in doing so, he shows that the adoption of high yield variety crops during the Green Revolution first had impacts for local level inequality and using fixed effects regressions shows that districts that increase their adoption of these HYV crops saw greater violence, specifically dacoity, which he interprets as a form of redistributive crime. Notably, he finds no similar effects on other types of crimes. And he also finds that the increase in HIV adoption had no effect on the left share of the vote, which suggests that dacoity emerged as a substitute to politics. Now, this is an enormously interesting paper, and I hope the suggestions I have can make its theoretical claims a little bit clearer and more persuasive. So the first feature of this paper, and Adi already anticipated that I might say something of this sort in the way he concluded his presentation, is that it's unclear to me whether what his arguments is <clears throat> focused on and, it, and his evidence is focused on are income shocks or genuine shifts in inequality doing the job. So in an agrarian economy like India, yearly shifts in temperature or rainfall can have dramatic income consequences. So this recent paper by David Blakesley and Ram Fishman that Adi cites fights for instance, find for instance that bad rainfall and high temperatures worsen all kinds of crimes, 
especially when they devastate crops and they do so pretty consistently across states and across decades and across districts in India. Now, those authors argue that income shocks generate desperation and they create conditions for dacoity. Now, what does this mean for your findings, Adi? I see two potential issues. The first is that with or without high yield variety crops, you have dacoity as a solution to bad income shocks. With HYV crops, what you have created now are sitting targets for roving bandits to attack because they know those are the places with greater recent wealth accumulation. So rather than a theory of redistribution, what HIV did was provide greater clarity to dakus about where to strike. So while the result point in the same direction as the Blakely and Fishman paper, the interpretations of the results can differ considerably. So this is not so much a finding about inequality and redistribution, but just the emergence of a more sophisticated crime industry that has also benefited from technology to refine its targets. Rural destitution and poverty might have declined at the same time as inequality growing and wealth accumulation increasing. So there's no incentive to protest and no incentive to join the left because life is pretty good even for the poor. But there are now plenty of new targets for experienced decoits. Only when you experience deprivation, when income shocks occur, do these statistics often spike more than their average level. So you have an empirical problem, which is compounded, I think, by the fact that you don't have district level crime stats before the HYV adoption, making a clean diff and diff possible. So one possibility is to directly confront this parallel interpretation and use the shifts in measures of inequality, which you have on a decade basis, to predict violence over a decade, or use the annual rainfall measures as a control in the fixed effects regressions to control for income effects and show that HYV, regardless of income shocks, led to more forms of decoity. Now, the second feature of this paper that puzzles me is your link to party politics. You argue that the lack of uptick in left party share should be interpreted as a failure to accommodate class aspirations of the poor. This made me curious about how you reconcile your violence findings with your own work on HYV crops yielding greater backward caste mobilization and representation in politics because of the emergence of a new entrepreneurial class of politicians through the Green Revolution. Now, this is important because new work by Omar Garcia Pons and Kanchan Chandra show that districts in India, which had greater absorption of backward castes into politics, saw less Maoist violence. Now, a form of violence which while more organized than the kinds that you're describing, are also more clearly redistributed in their goals. Now, they too focus on young men, disenchanted, either being channeled into subaltern politics or being channeled into violence as alternatives. So here, the focus on subaltern parties or subaltern politicians being absorbed into parties might be a more appropriate comparison for you than maybe just the left party. Maybe we need to think more about what sorts of parties are accommodating the disenchant disenchantment that you know, um, inequality might bring? I was also struck by the maps where you show that there's high HYV adoption in many parts of the country, but the places where the violence occurred are quite specific. So the Southern states, for instance, don't experience this level of violence, but we know what happens in the Southern states, which is a very early absorption of lower castes into politics that doesn't happen in many of the other parts of India. So I wonder whether you, the analytical lens to look for the alternative to violence is not so much the left vote, but other forms of subaltern politics absorbing these dis disenchanted you know, um, classes of the population. Now, um, you talked about the difficulties of this in the presentation, but we would love to know more about who these decoits are. Is there some way to give us more texture about what the political economy of their undertaking is? Is it possible to understand how mobilizing or recruiting or a violence occurs? Again, I think just describing what they do might persuade the readers more about the connections between the Green Revolution and decoity as a form of redistributive claims making and not just, you know, um, year on year 
income shocks generating a, a you know a, a need to redistribute to themselves mm -hmm. right a couple of smaller points several times you note that decoity suggests violence uh, means that your arguments are working while other forms of violence not having the same results show that it's not working. But why would that be the case? Wouldn't every type of violence increase if this is about redistribution, thieving, kidnapping, you know, uh, why do you think that not having these results is a way to disprove other reasons for why, you know, the connection doesn't hold. Rather, I would think then it provides evidence that criminal enterprises are getting more sophisticated with technology. So it, it, I, I just want you to talk through a little bit more about why some of these other types of petty grievances coming to fore is not happening. But overall, a great paper, a great read, and good luck, and I hope this was useful. Thank you so much, Pavi. Um, as we move into the, the Q&A, um, if you have a question for Adi, um, please leave it in the chat and I will moderate the questions and raise them um, to, to Adi. Um, uh, but um, Adi, do you want some a chance to, to respond to some of uh, Pavi's questions or would you like to move uh, directly to, to questions? We have a number that are coming in in the chat already. I'll just say something very quickly, which is thank you for the fabulous feedback. Um, you know, you raise uh, some things that I've been thinking about. Um, and, you know, um, in terms of how this relates to my other work and, um, you know, you know, the Green Revolution and the emergence of agrarian opposition parties and, uh, you know, backward caste mobilization, uh, the way I'm thinking about it is those parties ultimately kind of were focused more around subsidies um, policies that were targeted mainly at the kind of prospering agricultural producers, the landowners, the bullet cart capitalists who emerged out of the Green Revolution. In some cases, they did perhaps fold in the rural poor with other kinds of sort of um, policies, but that was more about political mobilization by the relative winners than the relative losers of technological change. At least that's how I'm thinking about it. Um, on the question of why decoity and not other forms of violence, why do I take that as evidence? You know, why would we not expect to see every other form of violence increase during this time? I guess the way I'm thinking about it is that, um, you know, if you think about other episodes, leave aside India, um, you actually look at the Green Revolution in other contexts. Um, uh, there's been work which looks at the violent reaction to technological change and often that violence is not just about redistribution or economic crime or subsistence, but it often incorporates symbolic elements um, of protest. And what I would argue is that in the Indian context, uh, the Kwaiti kind of incorporated this kind of folk tradition of kind of retribution or protest against oppressive rural power structures. Um, so in Ghana, for example, Jack Goody has a paper which looked at uh, rice burning was a reaction um, you know, fairly symbolic uh, to the Green Revolution. Um, in Malaysia, James Scott looks at a bunch of tactics. If you look at the uh, swing riots or you look at the Luddites, uh, the violence was very selective. Um, so that, that's kind of the idea I had in mind, but um, it's a question I'll think about for there. And if you, uh, thanks so much for that. And with that, I'll uh, stop talking. All right, thank you, Adi. Um, and now we're gonna move into Q and A. Uh, sure, I see your hand. I'll uh, I'll call on you in a second. Um, but I I wanted to to take advantage of my my position as as um, chair to to start asking you um, a couple of questions. I have two questions. One following up on what Pavi said um, about why don't we see sort of absorption and incorporation to other parties, especially in light of your other work. Um, and the results sort of present. Um, a, a, a puzzle um, that I didn't see resolved, um, which is that um, low status groups are organized enough to engage in forms of violence that require five or more people, um, but not organized enough to form new political parties, um, but also disciplined enough to ensure that um, smaller, pettier forms of crime that require five, four or less people um, decrease, right? So how do you discipline members enough to make sure that they only engage in organized forms of violence, um, but you're not disciplined enough uh, to try form emergent forms of political organization? 
right? Um, so there's enough collective action to pass some threshold, but not enough collective action to go uh, above and beyond that and sort of um, channel your pressures through um, through political parties. Um, so um, what is going on there? How do you how do you explain um, these sort of intermediate levels of collective action? Um, and then my second question is, um, it seems that violence is not the only um, option available um, to uh, to people in rural areas, right? Um, there's also exit as an option, um, and you can migrate to urban areas um, as a form of releasing pressure that is available, um, that is building up in, in rural areas. And especially in, in, in the period of the Green Revolution, where agriculture is becoming more productive, um, large farmers can sell surplus to cities. Another form of redistribution is making food cheaper um, in cities. Um, do we see any, any evidence of exit not being an option or people migrating to, um, to urban areas? And why is this not a mechanism that is, um, that is going on here? Um, yeah, thanks for those questions. Um, they're thought provoking. Um, so let me try and um, respond to them. Um, I'll respond in reverse order. So on the op possibility of exit. Um, so I've looked at, I've done some preliminary empirical analyses looking at um, how did the spread of HYV crops affect kind of the share of the population um, working in agriculture. Um, and it doesn't lead to a sort of displacement of people from agriculture. If anything, the spread of HYV crops tends to actually entrench the agricultural sector. So what I think is going on here, right, when I say biased technological change, is not that necessarily anyone's livelihoods are being made worse off in absolute terms. Um, and in some ways, you know, there's even an increased demand for labor, right, because HYV crops um, can now be, and the spread of irrigation means you have now multiple seasons and multiple crops in a year as opposed to just one. So there's lots of things going on here. I don't think that necessarily anyone was made off in worse off in absolute terms. Um, but what's going on is rising rural inequality. Um, some people are accumulating wealth much faster than others. Um, and that creates resentment and demands for redistribution. So what would this mean for exit? I guess it wouldn't necessitate um, exit, except to the extent that, you know, uh, the new technology is biased in absolute terms. And I'm not sure there's evidence for that being the case. Um, you know, I really like this characterization of Descartes as kind of being an representing an intermediate level of collective action. Um, and, you know, as to your question about why were, you know, why was it possible to organize this intermediate level of collective action, which required some form of discipline, um, but not enough to organize large scale kind of uh, collective action through the political system for redistribution. Um, I'm gonna hold off on giving a very strong answer to that. You know, I, I agree very much with Pavi that I, I also feel I need to do more reading about kind of the economic and social and political organization of Decreti on the ground. Um, and that might help me think about that question. Um, as to this question about, you know, why weren't these demands for redistribution um, absorbed or incorporated into other kinds of political parties, if not kind of parties on the left? Um, that's a good question. Um, and I think in ways, uh, the rural poor were folded into some of these agrarian opposition parties which emerged in the wake of the Green Revolution. I'm thinking specifically for example, the, the Telugu Basin Party in Andhra Pradesh, right, which kind of combined both subsidies for, you know, prospering farmers, but also kind of a lot of populist uh, policies, uh, you know, like free, highly subsidized food grains, uh, which would have been targeted at the rural core. Um, so that's just a preliminary response. All right, thank you. Um... Ashu, I'm going to call on you in just a second. I want to um, ask Banu's questions. Um, I believe he's in India. It's quite late for him. So um, uh, sure. Banu had, had two questions. Um, uh, first, um, he saw a graph showing a decline of the left ch changes by the 1980s, which coincided with a change in Dakoiti. Um, there is dramatic decline in left parties' performance in the decade following the emergency. Um, uh, as a result of extreme repression of leftist activist movements around that time. 
Um, therefore, Banner would contend that what we see with the left parties in the 70s and 80s isn't necessarily a perfectly natural expression of political preference. Um, so he wants you to convince him a little more about what we are learning so much from looking at that period. Um, we could also learn a lot more if you extend this graph into the present, and Aris Redzik's survey extends up until at least 2006 and includes questions on political preferences in, um, in later rounds. So that's the first question from Banu. And then the second question um, is that he was struck by the fact that this is looking to be very much a phenomenon confined uh, to the Northern Gangetic Basin, UP, MP, Bihar, West Bengal. Um, and the difference with the South, as, as, as Pavi pointed out. Um, and I wonder, uh, maybe ca uh, caste demographics could play a bit of a role here. Um, you mentioned Hobbeswam and his idea of social banditry as having its own culture and ethos, aesthetic, which is mentioned in this book, Chambal, um, written by Tarun Baduri. Um, is there a set of cultural reasons why this is much more prevalent in the North than in the South? Can I add to that? There is sure, a... So um, there is a North versus South question here. Can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. So Adi, uh, as Pavitra puts it, there's a North versus South question here. There's also an intra-North question here. Mm -hmm. um, uh, are you convinced? I think one of the two, two uh, figures you showed us suggested that um, High yielding variety um, seeds, HIV, HYV seeds, let's call them green revolution seeds, um, were used much more in Punjab and Haryana than in Bihar, Eastern UP, and Bengal, or, um, or even Southern UP, which is the Bundel Khand area, which is where a lot of decoity has historically taken place, or southeast, such as Mirzapur, which is, uh, you know, now lots of storied accounts of that, um, including Pulan Devi. So, um, so the north versus south could be one proposal for that uh, uh, Pavitra is making to you, namely that it's not just a class question, it's also a caste question. And the lower castes were much more successfully incorporated and much earlier incorporated in democratic party politics um, in the South than in the North. Um, so that's one. Second, um, it seems to me, if you go into intra-North variation, then the puzzle could be, uh, no, sorry, let's stay with the North-South variation first. The other, other uh, way to think about why the South did not see uh, uh, the, the, the uh, 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 spectacular rise in the coity, and correct me if I'm wrong, you know, uh, is also that the green revolution areas of the South, for example, Delta Ikandra and parts of, uh, parts of Tamil Nadu, also saw a great deal of industrialization consequent upon, uh, upon, upon um, uh, the Green Revolution. And, that, and one of the great puzzles about Punjab, at least, is that the, 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 uh, the biggest theater of Green Revolution in India saw very little industrialization. Hmm? So you had, um, in other words, um, uh, I'm suggesting perhaps that uh, not only the caste, the handling of the caste question in the South, but perhaps the rise of industry in green revolution areas provided a great deal of uh, absorption, potential absorption of, uh, for the classes that lost out in the countryside. Hmm? Um, the, Sorry, the, so, can yeah. you just say that part again? I just um, missed, missed that. So if you have green revolution taking place and then industrialization also taking off in the areas of the green revolution, mm -hmm. then the losers of the green revolution in the countryside have potential for absorption in the industrial slash urban sector. Okay. This is ex exit easier, is easier, right? Um, and therefore um, thinking of decoity as a way to hit back or, or, or um, 
forms of violence might be minimized because the exit option that is available. Now, that exit option was not available in Punjab the same way. When Punjab, for some reason, did not industrialize after going through very remarkable agricultural growth rate um, consequent, upon, consequent upon the Green Revolution. Right. So, but, but nonetheless, um, so you could say that the quality would be higher in Punjab as a result because the industrial option is not available. But we also, I think, no, can, tell me if I'm wrong, the quality is not very, the incidence is not very high of banditry in Haryana and Punjab. It is in Eastern UP, Central UP, Southern UP, Bihar, which is where the, the ad adoption of green revolution seeds was much, much lower and in some cases, the Green Revolution didn't even take off because irrigation was not available. Irrigation ratio in Punjab and Haryana touched 70 to 80 percent. 70 to 80 percent of the land was irrigated, and without irrigation, you couldn't have the Green Revolution hmm? um, in, in, in a real sense, right? And that's why Delta Ekandra also worked so well. That's why the Green Revolution didn't take off in Gujarat and Maharashtra because, because irrigation ratio was so low. Hmm? Okay, so. So, so there are there are two puzzles emerging here. Decoity incidence of decoity low in southern India, partly because of caste reasons and absorption of caste in politics, low caste in politics, and partly because industrialization took off after the Green Revolution. Hmm? And in the north, while the potential for decoity could have been higher. Uh, following your logic, in Punjab and Haryana and Western UP, most probably, and do correct if this, this statement is wrong, most probably the, the incidence of decoity was higher and much higher, much higher in Eastern UP, Central UP, Southeastern UP, Bihar, than in Western UP. Hmm? So those are the two uh, puzzles that I'm I'm, I'm, I'm raising for you. Can you tell us about decoity in Punjab and Haryana, for example? Um, yes. Okay. So let, let me. Um, okay. So there's a set of questions um, which I take to be thinking about kind of uh, regional heterogeneity, to put it that way, um, which is, you know, why does this, when you look at the map, decoity seems to be a phenomenon that's concentrated in the North. Um, and then actually you're asking, um, is it the case that the quality was greater in Eastern UP than in Western UP, Haryana, Punjab, for example, when you know we think of the Green Revolution as being concentrated in Western UP um, and so forth. Um, okay. So, I mean, so the first thing just empirically, right? Um, where, what is, what, is, what is the variation that's driving the estimates in these regressions? Uh, those maps can be slightly misleading because they just show you the cross-sectional distribution of just average decoities, right? What I'm looking at specifically is take one district, right? As it experiences a relative increase in HYV crop adoption relative to another, does it over time within that district experience a relative increase in decoity relative to the other? So it's really over time variation that's driving the estimates. Um, and in some specifications, I do have these regional year fixed effects, which means that even looking within the South, looking within the East, looking within the North and looking within the West, over time as districts sort of intensified in the extent of HYV crop adoption, you saw relative increases in the occurrence of the quality. But it's still very true, right? Um, if you just look at, you know, I would have, I guess I don't know, but I would have to look at if we looked at the relative responsiveness of crime to the increase in HYV crop adoption, would it be the case uh, that uh, in the South, the kind of responsiveness of crime to technological change is lower than in the North? It may well be, right? Um, I can't say for sure. Uh, but if it were the case, what would be some potential hypotheses for that? Um, you know, that's, I like this idea about, um, you know, exit options into industry being one potential one, right? Um, I also really appreciate the, you know, this idea that um, 
you know, incorporation into lower caste parties and politics may have provided another avenue for articulation of those demands. Um, another possibility which, uh, you know, Hanu had uh, mentioned um, was, did this have something to do with like culture or caste or tradition? Um, something you do see in those maps is, um, you know, Dekoiti is concentrated in the Gangetic belt. I mean, it's a, it's a national phenomenon, certainly, but it's unusually concentrated in the Gangetic belt. Um, and I think there you do have these kind of folk traditions of, you know, Thuggy and Dekoiti, which were very much concentrated in those regions, which potentially made these kind of repertoires of like collective action and contention kind of particularly salient as a way of sort of expressing those demands. Emrick, if you don't mind, a quick two finger. One yeah, sentence, yeah. which is, Adi, you might want to explore the 1931 or 21 census to see if there's variation in specific castes that have historically engaged in these kinds of decoity as an occupation. You know, the, the British documented specific castes as being, you know, in the business of thieving. Right, so intensity of certain groups and what it meant for their livelihoods through technological change. You know, it gave them new avenues to expand their historic skill set. right? It could be another explanation for where it's stronger and weaker after Green Revolution. Thanks, yeah, that would, that would be a great um, path forward empirically. Um, in terms of uh, Hanu Joshi's other comments about the emergency, um, yeah, I mean, of course, this is a period in India where there's a lot of violence that's taking place in different forms, right? There's government repression. Um, if you think about Atul Kohli's book on, you know, democracy and discontent, there was this sense that the 70s and 80s were this period of this growing social disorder um, and violence of a variety of forms. Um, the way I interpret the context of the emergency is um, perhaps the Circumstances were special, but I think in another sense, it's just another example that of how, um, you know, demands for redistribution don't just automatically emerge from, uh, or organized movements for redistribution uh, sort of uh, with left-wing parties don't just automatically emerge in response to uh, sort of preferences or demands for redistribution. There can be all kinds of barriers, some of those resources, some of them in the form of explicit government repression and perhaps that makes these kinds of resort to these kinds of tactics, um, especially likely. Just a preliminary thought. Okay, Adi, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna raise two um, different questions from from the chat uh, for you. Uh, I'm gonna start with uh, Tanushri's, um, and she asks. Um, why is crime the Koizhi a more lucrative path in entering politics? Um, so they both require some level of power in organizing. Um, and this also connects to your final methodological point on pointing out that the Daku pathway is a form of protest against the political system rather than to be co-opted by it. Um, however, to say that these criminal activities have elements of politi political protest, have you located narrative or qualitative evidence, such as evidence of organizing, uplifting the oppressed, giving to the poor, biographies, um, or, or anything of the sort. So that's, that's the first question. Um, again, both on the, the sort of cost threshold uh, of, of entering politics. Um, the, the second question about more contemporary matters um, from Goran Gadas. Um, what, um, what, what lessons does, does your work have for the current moment in farmers unrest and agriculture reform? Um, is this, uh, are there distributional um, implications of the current farmer unrest? Is it led more by, by rich farmers uh, or um, is it serving the interests of rural poor farmers? How do you, how do you see um, the current moment? Um, yes, thank you for those questions. Um, so just to respond to Tanushri first, um, the way I understood the question, I think, is why, from a cost-benefit kind of calculus, would one um, participate or in or kind of support the party um, as opposed to just engaging in politics at the local level? Um, um, I guess the way I'm thinking about it is thinking about the nature of kind of Congress party organization, right, which was the dominant party at the time. 
um, or even thinking about the new kind of agrarian opposition parties, which started to emerge in the 70s and 80s, like the Janta Party. Um, all of the local, I mean, for the most part, local party organization was heavily dominated by landowning groups or rural elites. Um, the way I'm thinking about it is there would have been significant barriers to entry for someone who was a landless laborer or a kind of powerless tenant to acquire a lot of political power, um, especially when local party organization is controlled by these factions often of landed interests. Uh, so given those constraints, you know, an alternative means of expressing protest or uh, making a living or both uh, might have been to participate in Dekwaiti, right? Um, so there's evidence which suggests that, you know, depending on economic conditions, you know, you have some people who are professional Dekwaites, lifelong Dekwaites, then you have people who kind of move into Dekwait gangs temporarily as economic need dictates. Um, but Dekwaites also relied to a great extent on wider social networks and kind of popular legitimacy. You know, their activities uh, could not have gone on without some kind of tacit uh, popular support in some ways. And that's another way in which, you know, a low cost form of protest would be, you know, not to report, you know, someone you know to be a Dekwait to the authorities or to perhaps even warn them of, you know, coming police action or to provide them with some kind of assistance and so forth. Um, I think those are things, you know, this idea about looking at biographies or again, you know, Pavi's suggestion of maybe looking at some case studies or some careful studies of just like the organization of some specific Dekwaites or Dekwait gangs, uh, that would be interesting. Um, on this question about the, you know, the farmers protests that are going on right now, um, you know, I obviously, you know, I started to think about uh, what is the relevance of this study to what's going on um, now. And there are important similarities um, and important differences. Um, and these are just my very preliminary thoughts. You know, I need to study what's going on with these farmers uh, protests uh, a lot more. What is similar to what I observe in this paper? Um, I think what's similar is that when um, groups of people don't find articulation of their preferences or interests or grievances within the political system. They feel like they lack voice within the formal political system. Uh, you resort to contentious tactics, right? Um, in the context of Dekwaiti, this took the form of crime and violence, specific crime. Um, in the case of the farmers' protests, right, um, it's taking the form of large scale marches, protests, you know, something that's much more overt. Um, and here I think is where it maybe differs from, you know, the Dekoiti, right? This is kind of overt contentious tactics and protests. Um, drawing on a different kind of tradition, all of the farmers' marches and rallies that uh, occurred during the Green Revolution. Um, and this was much more led by the kind of prosperous, uh, upwardly mobile landowning farmers, uh, you know, leaders like Charan Singh, uh, you know, who epitomized that movement. Um, so I kind of think the social base of the, uh, of the farmers, uh, farmers protests is a little bit different. Um, this is maybe more about, um, you know, the, prosper the groups that prospered during the Green Revolution created this regime of subsidies for agriculture, you know, this manifestation of agrarian power, you know, as Ashu has worked on. Um, and they are now in an urbanizing society, you know, facing threats to the system of agricultural subsidies. These are groups that have traditionally been powerful in the political system, which is a little bit different than the rural poor um, who took this more covert route of protest in Dekwaiti um, that I documented in this paper. That's my point though. Adi, one, uh, one place that, um, as, as I hear you talking and responding to, to questions that I, um, that I didn't see in the paper, um, was thinking about this in a broader general equilibrium framework of uh, Albert Hirschman, right? So you rely on the Marxists um, a lot. Um, and for the Marxists, sort of violence and uh, protest is overdetermined, but there, there are several solutions to this, right? There's um, there's voice, which I think is what you're showing here. Um, if you don't like the system, you complain about it, um, and you complain about it through 
low levels of violence. Um, there's exit, uh, both to uh, uh, urbanizing and industrializing uh, urban centers. Um, and then there's loyalty. Um, so uh, acquiescing to the system uh, as is. Um, and it seems that a lot of the questions that you're getting are around like um, the relative balance between choosing those three options in, um, in, in this situation. Um, yeah, sure. Ashu? You're on mute, Ashu. To, to consider, uh, first of all, I think the use of the term weapons of the weak here is extremely creative. I should note, um, I have uh, the, the, Mal the, the Malaysian countryside where the term was born. Um, in the works of uh, Jim Scott. I mean, that's, this is not how he uses it. It's a very creative extension of the idea of weapons of the weak. Um, and then also the connection to social banditry and the, you know, in, in Hobbes Worm, and then also connection to, to Eric um, uh, uh, E.P. Thompson. That's all, it's very, very creative. I think the, the way it's the, your paper is set up, Adi. Um, so that's the, the it's with a with a note of admiration that I'm I'm saying this, but I think the, you might want to um, uh, think about what Pavitra is urging you to do, uh, which is that I, it may well be, and she might be right about this. It may well be that it's certain castes or certain yeah certain castes which. Um, have developed the skill set called called decoity, um, and they are, in particular, uh, distributed in certain parts of the country, rather than necessarily randomly distributed over the green revolution areas. Hmm. Um, uh, the second point here is that that's from the conflict literature, which which you might want to ponder as you proceed further with this very, possibly very creative link here that you're proposing. Um, um, obviously it needs more work, but possibly very creative as I said. The, that is the conflict literature also said decoity, not ab about decoity per se, but uh, organized violence led by a group, let's say, and the, of course the most, um, paradigmatic form of civil wars. Huh? It also requires a certain kind of geographical specificity, mountainous areas, forested areas, where, and when I think of my childhood in UP, I also recall that areas that were closer to, to forests and closest, for example, East UP and Southeast UP, I, as a child, I used to hear stories about decoits there, and decoits were fairly venerated figures. You're right about that. Hmm? They were fairly venerated. Pulam Devi was a venerated figure in Mirzapur. Hmm? But there are other places in Hamirpur, Banda, the southern part of uh, the Bundelkhand part of UP. Um, they were all, they had fairly venerable decoit figures. Daku Man Singh was a very venerable figure. Very venerable figure. And yes, you're right to talk about Shole as, uh, as, 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 as plugging into that narrative plugging into the narrative. But recall that Shole was also in an, a very secluded, um, what was his name? I forget. The Daku there, uh, who's no more, who died about uh, 15 years ago. The Amjad Daku Khan there was, is Gabbar Singh Ashu. How can you Gabbar forget? Singh, Gabbar Singh, Gabbar Singh. So Gabbar Singh, Gabbar Singh, the entire Gabbar Singh operation was in a very secluded area of Ramnagar in Karnataka. We, you can actually go to that place and see for yourself. And some other famous decoits of Karnataka, Tamil Nadu have also emerged in the forested areas, right? So the one idea from conflict violence literature to which you referred that may be relevant here is also the geographical or topographical specificity hmm, of the areas in which decoity normally flourishes, plus the, its indexation with caste to some extent as opposed to a random expression hmm, of unrest uh, stemming from the distributional consequences of the Green Revolution. And uh, one last uh, two finger point on this, 
George Blinn, I think you might have read that piece. George Blinn's uh, um, one of the first uh, economic historians to write about the Green Revolution. Uh, his piece in Economic Development and Cultural Change, I, I, just, I just checked while you're talking, 1983, uh, Green Revolution Revisited, which also talks about how in Punjab, while it started, in a way which perhaps impoverished the lower peasantry, after four or five years, it began to generate so much demand for their work. And as Green Revolution trickled down from large farmers to smaller farmers, you got to a point by 1980 that on a two acre farm or 2.5 acre farm, given a family's size of five, you could generate a surplus. Right. Now, 2.5 acre farm is a small farm. Of course, the Punjab was 80% irrigated. So that's a 85% irrigated. So 2.5 may be equal to eight, eight or nine or 10 acres in Eastern UP, right? something like that in Punjab. So anyway, the point here is that the unrest that you're pointing to in Punjab and Haryana, if, if I understand what Blaine is writing, uh, and of course, I covered this in my first book. By late 1970s, smaller farmers began to embrace green revolution in a very big way, if not earlier. And the landless poor also began to be absorbed so much in the employment that was being generated that instead of the landless poor of Punjab and Haryana providing all the labor, you have to import labor from Eastern UP and Bihar by the late 1970s. So you could see those trains coming at, at the, in, in March from Bihar to, to Western UP, from Bihar to, to Haryana and, and Punjab, bringing labor for harvesting wheat, right? And similarly, um, I think uh, the Kharif crop, Kharif crop would be about, about September, October, you know, um, uh, harvesting of Kharif in, around September, October. You had this huge migration of seasonal uh, labor from Bihar and, and Eastern UP into this a these areas. So, so the, the, the distributional consequences became very different by the late 70s is the, is the main point I'm raising. And George Blinn does a very good job of, uh, good job of that. There's also uh, work done by G.S. Bhalla, who used to teach at JNU and was an agricultural economist, which goes into the question of what was the farm size given a family of five by 1980 that had begun to produce a surplus in Punjab, Haryana, and Western UP. And I think he says something like two, two acres in Punjab and three acres in, in, in Western UP. It was that productive, the agriculture by that time. Yeah. Thank you, thank you Ashu. Um, Adi, we, we're, we're running out of time. So I, um, I don't know if you want to respond to Ashu's comment or um, two finger comment, but there's also one more question in the chat. Um, and then I'm going to give you the final word. Um, to, to wrap up, um, one question from Naoko in the chat. What about the question of mechanization in conjunction with the Green Revolution? Mechanization is displacing need for labor. Um, Adi, you have uh, the final word. Yeah, so I'll, I'll work that question into my response. Um, so that relates very much to Ashu's point about you know the complex distributional consequences of the Green Revolution, especially how it varied over time. Um, and I agree very much. You know, I'm not um, you know subscribing to the kind of uh, Marxist dictum that technological change must be immiserating, you know, kind of thing. Um, uh, and I agree that what's interesting is I think the bias of technological change during the Green Revolution did change over time. The scale bias absolutely did diminish over time. Um, and that would be very consistent with that spike in banditry that you saw, right? It peaks around 1980s, but then it diminishes thereafter. Um, which is exactly the period when the Green Revolution is kind of spreading to smaller landowners. Um, so that would make a lot of sense. Um, and in terms of, uh, you know, is this random unrest? Um, and you're, you know, Ashu, you're pushing back against that. Um, and uh, I would very much agree with that. Um, I think it's exactly not random unrest. Um, mm. It is, uh, Demand, it, let's, let's call it form of protest and small scale redistribution that takes that form, you know, given certain available repertoires of contention that exist. 
Now, where do those repertoires of contention come from? Um, it might have to do with, you know, the prevalence of certain sort of caste groups, you know, and the skills that they've developed in different places. Um, that's like a tricky question because, of course, you know, there's this colonial trope about criminal castes and things. Yeah. Perhaps there's some element of, uh, like, uh, you know, truth in it. I don't know. Um, but I do really like, uh, you know, Emmerich uh, thinking about, you know, whether through Albert Hirschman or, you know, some other framework, you know, typologies of reaction um, to sort of inequality generated by technological change. When does it take the form of voice? When does it turn take the form of exit? When does it take the form of loyalty? And if voice, you know, what kind of voice, you know, marches, violence, you know, political action, um, and talking through the costs and benefits of those different choices, I think would be really fruitful for this paper. Um, and I really appreciate everyone's feedback, you know, laying out sort of uh, potential avenues forward. All right. Um, thank you so much, Adi, for this wonderful uh, presentation this time. Pavi, yep. thank you so much for your comments. Uh, please join me in thanking um, Adi for, uh, for the talk. Thank you so yeah. much. It was my pleasure. <laughs> Adi, a new title, Exit Voice in Dequity. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. All right. Thank, thank you, you everybody. Bye. Bye.